This is Josh Demery with the Established Facts. I've got Derek Newson here, um, another one of our co-hosts, and we have the excellent pleasure, I guess you could call it. I don't know he will, but uh, to speak with Ryan Dancy from Goblin Works. He is uh, working with Paizo in developing the Pathfinder massive multiplayer online game. Uh, taking, I guess, the approach that not many other MMOs take. Is that a, probably a good way to say that? Yeah, that's, that's true. We're going to build a game that's primarily a sandbox, which is a game where emergent player behavior is the most important aspect of the design, as opposed to a game like World of Warcraft, which is a theme park where players interacting with dungeons or uh, just killing monsters is the primary mode of interaction. Interesting. Um, I've uh, played several MMOs, and one of the biggest challenges is when you have to quote-unquote farm so you can actually get to a point where you can actually do cooler things. Uh, how are you guys handling that? Yeah, so what you're describing is um, essentially an element of a lot of theme park game design, where you have to do something boring and repetitive that doesn't matter, so you can do something that does matter. So that's one of the key differences with a sandbox. In a sandbox, everything you do has some relevance to some aspect of the design. So you may be out killing monsters repetitively, but you're doing that for a reason. You're not just doing that because you have to hit a certain number as a, uh, on, a, uh, um, on a reputation graph or because you're waiting for a, a, a rare item drop or something. You're doing it because you need uh, resources to, um, to contribute something to the economy or you're trying to reduce the threat level in an area below a certain point so that something more interesting can happen uh, or you're defending um, an area so that your friends can go and do something else while you take care of a threat. So, I mean, that's part of the overall game design philosophy is try to make everything you do meaningful in the context of the game. You know, the thing I find interesting about MMOs in general, I know that I've attempted to play EVE Online, which is a big sandbox, uh, that, and even then I'm a PlayStation 3 user with their Dust 514, but then I've also attempted uh, World of Warcraft, uh, which you've described both of those concepts, the theme park versus the sandbox. Um, what else is going to separate you from the... T I mean, they're two pretty pretty good-sized companies in the MMO genre. What is it that's going to separate you guys from them? Sure. Well, I mean, right off the bat, we have the Pathfinder intellectual property. Uh, Pathfinder Pathfinder kind of has come out of nowhere and become the best-selling tabletop RPG in the market. And uh, the Pathfinder world, Galarian, is an incredibly well-designed, very rich world. It has a great visual identity, and it has a great backstory as well. There's a lot of plots and stories and characters in that world that are interesting to players. So we start with a great IP, a great intellectual property to build from. And then the next step that we take is that there aren't a lot of fantasy sandbox MMOs. EVE is a science fiction sandbox, and it has essentially you know, cornered that section of the market. So we want to stay out of the science fiction venue, but stay in the fantasy side, where there really aren't a lot of competitors. If you want a theme park experience like World of Warcraft, there are a lot of competitors. Almost every MMO that's released is essentially a fantasy theme park. Uh, there's just so little competition for the fantasy sandbox space that we don't think that we're going to face that much opposition trying to gain market share. Uh, speaking of Eve, um, I tried to learn Eve, and uh, the joke is that you basically jump off a cliff because that's how you learn how to play Eve. Right. Um, is that going to be similar to this? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, uh, now, more on the technical side, uh, how, how are players going to join individual instances on servers, or is it going to be a persistent thing across multiple servers? Yeah, we're going to try to have one server. Uh, our ability to do that is going to be dictated to some degree by the technology and the middleware that we license. So uh, our plan currently is to have one server, and we're going to grow the game slowly over time. So uh, technology, processor speed, software should keep up with us so that we don't have to shard the game into multiple servers. Um, if we had to shard the game, we would probably look into doing something geographically rather than logically. So we would have a European server and a North American server and an Asian server. But we don't intend to do that. That's not the plan. Cool. Cool. Well, I, I think the only other thing I, I, I know that everyone's going to want to ask, and I know you guys just did a big Kickstarter with your technology demo, and I really hope that goes well. Uh, do you guys have an expected launch date? Yes. That's fantastic. <laughs> when is the expected launch date? Well, we're not announcing that yet, but as soon as we're ready to announce it, it'll be well publicized. Okay, great. Uh, do you guys have um, an idea about subscription or that sort of thing that you could let yeah. us know? 
Absolutely. So we are going to follow the same model that Turbine developed with Dungeons & Dragons Online and then Lord of the Rings, which is a hybrid microtransaction subscription model. So if you want to, you can pay a monthly subscription that will be automatically debited from your credit card or your payment mechanism. And you essentially will get all of the basic play experience. Or you can play for free and you can purchase elements of the game uh, via microtransactions. So um, you can get the entire thing that a subscriber gets. It'll cost slightly more than just paying the subscription. In addition to that, there will be other things, mostly um, appearance, attractive items, mounts, things that don't have a lot of mechanical effect that both free players and subscribers could purchase if they want to. Um, so, like, if you want to have a really awesome horse, you could buy that in the microtransaction store. It won't have any effect on how fast you travel. It'll just look cool. So that's basically the strategy. Um, and uh, as the uh, Pathfinder system expands and grows, that sort of thing, uh, do you guys have sort of, uh, and I know this is sort of before everything, but it's like as new races come out, as new classes come out, do you guys have a plan for that? Yeah, so uh, what we would like to do is have everything in the Pathfinder tabletop game in the online game. That's just not really possible given the time and resource constraints that we have. So we're starting with the core rulebook, and our first goal is to work towards getting all of that content in the game. When we launch, it's likely that we won't have everything in the game, but we'll have a plan that will show how the things that are in the core book will get into the game relatively soon. And then after we achieve that pace of development and we have a good sense for how long it takes to add a, a race or, or a, a whole new archetype, a whole new class, um, then we'll be able to kind of roadmap it for the fans and say this is what we're working on and this is how we plan to develop. So uh, if we imagine this game running for 10 years, yeah, at the end of 10 years, probably most of the stuff that's in at least the, uh, the core books and the ultimate books will have some kind of representation in the game. Um, you know, that's kind of the goal. Um, I was reading through your blog, and I won't take much more of your time, but reading through the blog and so forth, one of the things you brought up was this idea of rolling out in phases, yep. um, the 6,000 and then 12,000 seat phases. Uh, I was talking about it with other hosts and so forth, and one of the concerns that came up in that was, are the first 6,000 people going to be ultimately more powerful than the people who join a year later? Yeah, so the answer to that question is no. And making that happen is part of the design challenge that we face, right? Um, there's always going to be an advantage to, uh, to having a player experience. So people who get in the game early will, be, as humans, as players, they will just know more about the way the game works. They'll have played it more. They'll have seen it develop more. Uh, they'll just be more familiar with it. So there's no way we can ever address those issues. But in-game issues like control of territory and character development and level of power, those are all things that we think we can control mechanically and, and through the design to make sure that that playing field remains, if not level, at least opportunistic, so that a group that comes in and works really hard can rise up and be as powerful as anybody that was in the game on day one. Yeah, power level, that's another quest, big question, because um, are you guys going to limit it to 20, 20 levels like it is on the tabletop, or are you planning on going beyond that? So uh, you can imagine um, Dungeons & Dragons and, and Pathfinder as having four segments to character power level. First through fifth level are rookie adventures. They're leaving their home villages and going out into the wilderness, and it's very dangerous, and they die a lot, and um, it's, it's a hard life to be a, a, a low-level adventurer, right? Then the second bracket is a sixth to tenth level, and at that level, they're kind of becoming like the characters that we see in a lot of novels. Uh, you know, they can face a lot of challenges, they have resources to recover from setbacks, uh, but they're primarily still engaged in what we call heroic adventuring. They're they're uh, they're a small group of people. They're going out into the wilderness. They're confronting a challenge, and then they go back to a settled area and re recoup and recover. Then from 11th to 15th level, they start to have a larger impact on the world around them. They start to become involved in politics and diplomacy, and they start to found uh, you know, settlements and kingdoms, and they're, and they're focusing on the way the world is developing around them. And they, they mostly don't face existential problems. They're not in danger of dying, or if they are, death is a, meaning, a meaningless setback. Um, they're more focused on uh, objectives that are impactful to the world around them. So, uh, you know, a demon incursion is coming and they need to fight that back. Or uh, the king has died and somebody has to choose a successor for the whole kingdom, right? And then the last level is, from 16th to 20th level, they're essentially superheroes. They can go anywhere in the world and outside the world. Um, they almost never die, and if they do die, it's usually a catastrophe. Um, or it's such a minor setback they don't even notice. They're down for a round and they're back in the fight. Um, their, their interests uh, are, are global in scope. Uh, they're worried about threats to the whole planet. They're worried about threats to reality. They're dealing with um, massive uh, you know, armies on the move or changes in, in the way the world itself will fundamentally work. Okay, So Pathfinder Online is going to focus on that space between 6th level and about 
middle of the, um, the third tier, right around you know, 12, 13, 14th level. Okay? So the characters will be primarily heroically adventuring, but they'll also be founding uh, small towns that we call settlements. A couple hundred people, a couple thousand people, maybe uh, several thousand people at the very high end, right? Um, and their attention is going to be focused inside the River Kingdoms, which is a very small part of the very big map of Galeria. So they're not going to be worried about, you know, the, the threats to the world. Um, they're going to be worried about the threats to their little area in, in the River Kingdoms. So in the tabletop game, uh, the assumptions that are baked into the game are that if you play for about a year and a half, you can take a character from first level to 20th level, and you'll experience that whole continuum of, of character development. So Pathfinder Online is designed to run with the same characters for a much, much longer time than a year and a half. So your pace of development is going to be a lot slower, and it's going to be in that constrained range. So in the beginning, of course, your characters will be kind of rookies, and they'll have to kind of learn the ropes. So that period will pass relatively quickly. And then you'll spend years and years and years of time as you slowly become more, uh, more evolved and specialized in doing that heroic adventuring type of gameplay. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so we're at Gen Con 2012. Many people have noticed this. Um, and 2013 is going to be a big year for, for many different people. We've, of course, heard Wizards is making a big deal as they're prepping through D&D Next. But we're big Paizo Pathfinder fans, and we know that uh, they're getting ready to do this big Ultimate Game Mastery Guide or something like that. Campaign Guide, that's what it is. They just released the Ultimate Equipment Guide. Um, my question for you is, is there anything you've heard about that you are looking forward to between 2012 and 2013? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I always keep a really close eye on, on the industry. I'm, I'm a hobby gamer at heart. I, I play tabletop games and card games and, and, and board games. Um, you know, I'm super excited about uh, the, the, um, the announcement that Paizo made at PaizoCon that uh, Bobby Yaga is going to be returning to Galarian. There's a, like a hundred-year cycle that she engages in, and she comes back, takes her most recent daughter off the throne, puts a new daughter in place, and there's just a lot of chaos in that. That's a great story arc. I'm really excited about that. Uh, uh, I was actually just over in the tournament hall, uh, you know, looking around at what the what games are being played there. I got to give a, a shout out to Legend of the Five Rings, you know, which I co-designed. There, every year is awesome for them. Um, this year, they're having a 10,000th card celebration. Um, that'll be 10,000 unique cards in the game, uh, and they always have an ongoing story arc stuff that'll be, you know, really cool. Um, my. Uh, my consulting partner, Luke Peterschmidt, is working on a game called Castle Dice. That's a, a, like a four or five player uh, board game uh, where you, um, you build a castle and uh, develop your resources and compete with you know, your friends to see who can uh, you know, make the coolest and most interesting little castle in, in the wilderness. That looks really cool. That's a, that's a game that he's going to be announcing um, later this year. So yeah, there's always a lot of interesting stuff that's out there in bubbling. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I know this is very informative for me. So please, when you get the chance, go check out GoblinWorks.com. They've got a blog available that explains how the process is going forward. And, of course, check us out at TheEstablishedFacts.com. Have a nice day, and we'll see you later. See ya. Bye. <laughs>